Welcome to Students Incorporated, a podcast where we dive into relevant topics and issues related to the world of business, technology, education, and design. I'm your host, Mr. Jason. Episodes include student conversations, interviews with thought leaders, and inspirational stories with an international flavor. This podcast is created and produced with the help of students from the International Community School of Bangkok. today's episode, we'll be discussing social impact through technology and the idea of leaving a legacy. My co-hosts for this episode, Ronnie and Darren, will be conducting our guest interviews. In our first segment, we spend time talking with Dr. Narisa, founder and CEO of CogoPay.com. And then in our second segment, we'll talk with our very own Mr. Mike about social impact initiatives that students are involved with here at ICS. But first, let's get our quote of the day and hear some headline news. Our quote of the day comes from Warren Buffett. He says, Someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. Buffett is a famous businessman and philanthropist. He's considered the most influential investor of the 20th and 21st century as he has accumulated a personal fortune of more than $100 billion. In 2020, he aimed to donate 99% of his wealth to charitable organizations. He donated most of the money to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is a great example of a legacy. Although he has amassed large amounts of wealth, he hopes to leave behind a legacy of generosity and care for others. Now, on to news from Down Under. In a small town in Australia, millions of dead fish have been found on the riverside. This is happening due to a lack of oxygen in the water because of large heat waves across the country. The region has already gone through tremendous environmental pressures due to the continuous flooding. It is predicted that there will be increased rainfall, heat, and fires. This is not the first time this has occurred as dead fish were currently found in this region in February. In financial news, SVB Bank in California, known as Silicon Valley Bank, collapsed a few weeks ago. The bank was forced to shut down due to several factors, including poor management, liquidity issues, and rising inflation and interest rates. In short, the bank's long-term investments lost significant value and depositors withdrew large amounts of money running up to the shutdown. This is the largest bank to fail in the US since Washington Mutual in 2008. On to the weather. Recently, a cyclone hit Madagascar, Malawi, and Mozambique. It has developed in the Indian Ocean more than a month ago and had only just hit Africa. This has been the longest cyclone ever recorded in history. It was named Cyclone Freddy. The death toll crossed 300 and more than 700 were injured. The cyclone displaced 80,000 people. It caused much devastation across these countries due to the landslides and floods. Thank you for the quote in the headline news. It's my pleasure to introduce our first guest of this episode, Dr. Narisa. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down with the Students Incorporated podcast team. Ronnie will start off this segment with our first question. Thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your company and what you do? Oh, hi. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Dr. Narisa Chavidu-Or. I'm Thai. I was born in Bangkok, um, but I live in the UK for 27 years. My background, um, both in academics and the business. I was a lecturer here before at Jolangkorn University for two years. After I finished my PhD at LSC, I worked full-time as the CFO, Chief Financial Officer, and worked part-time teaching at my university, LSE, where I got my PhD and also teach at King College. And um, I have 10 years career break when I have my children, when they are 0 to 10 years old. And, and I work part-time, flexible hours as the advisors for Japanese companies. And then I set up my own business, CocoPay, um, two and six years ago. Yeah, so... I have 12 years planned, so uh, halfway through. So since this episode is about social impact, can you explain the vision of CogoPay and how it strives to be socially conscious? Okay, I have to tell you the story about how I started CogoPay. I was interested in blockchain technology in 2016 first. That's why I am um, interested in fit- fintech first. So what I did, I joined the blockchain, the first group of a blockchain in London to get to know, after I read the book and I was interested, get to know um, people in the same area and did some research because I, I came from research background as well. So we did some research about blockchains 
And my interest is how to use technology like blockchain to help people. So this is from the beginning, how to uh, help people using the blockchain technology. My compassion, okay, besides working uh, full-time in finance and set up my own business, I also uh, part-time missionary. So my compassion for missionary work into two groups, orphanage children and the homeless. So what I did before is every year I do my missionary work part-time. And I did in Japan with the OMF to do help homeless people. And I always come back to Thailand to Mesot and help orphanage home. So I always think about how to use technology blockchain to, uh, in the beginning, to move the funds, to donate to the charities fast and secure and cheaper than going to the normal banking process. So that's how I always start my business. That's the beginning, you know, we start from thinking about how to use technology to help people. And when we decide the product, the function, we always think about, okay, the function would have something that we can use to, to help them as well. I have the project. I have, I done a bit, but I haven't um, launched everywhere in UK and Europe yet. The project called Pay It Forward. My dream is one day everyone can use Coco Pay to pay for their own food or drink in the cafe or shop and pay another portion for someone else as well. And when the homeless people or people who ha don't have money, maybe a single mom, single dad, see the size of our local Coco Pay, they can come to the shop or cafe and ask for the food or drink that someone else already paid for them. So something like that is always in my mind, you know, I want to make it work. Besides a like, normal business like, you know, B2C, um, cross-border payment using Coco Pay, um, or we're going to have digital bank. We provide IBAN accounts in GBP and Euro, um, hopefully within Q3 this year. So this is a normal product when also we always add something on uh, and also we would like to keep a percentage some percentage of our profits for the social impact projects that we want to help in the futures as well so that's all about coco pay who we are and what we plan that's very interesting thank you so much for sharing so since you're in the financial technology sector what are some ways that you feel that the industry as a whole could improve in the area of becoming more socially conscious i I think you just see a lot of people now problems of the crash in the crypto exchange, cryptocurrencies, and also in the banking system at the moment. Um, the problem is lots of people still abuse the system, right? They, if you see what happened in the crypto exchange, has been collapsed because they used other people' money or assets, digital currencies, for their own benefits. I mean. You know, for us, we are controlled by the central bank and regulators. We, we're not allowed to use other people's money to do the businesses. So if we make losses, a lot of people, company make losses, and that's why they cannot have the money or either cryptocurrency to return to the owners with the customers. So we have to have proper compliance system in place. And also we have to abide with the rules and make sure that people who run the businesses mm. Um, have the integrity and honest and do properly to their businesses. And then we want to be the role model for other fintech companies to see what we're doing, how we can use technology to help people. What I've been doing since last year in Dubai, we arranged, organized three conferences already. It's free for uh, like my people who believe that we are interested in technology and how to use technology to help people. So I arranged the first forum uh, in Dubai about blockchain and financial inclusion. And the first one who doing that, I mean, and the woman father who organize uh, blockchain, normally you have to pay for it, but for us it's free. I mean, not focusing only our businesses, where we focus about like my people, invite like my people to talk about technology and financial inclusion, blockchain and financial inclusion. And the second one is a blockchain and how to use the blockchain in their businesses. And also we are also uh, focus on financial inclusion. And the last one last month is the third uh, conference that we had is about um, metaverse and how we use metaverse for the businesses. And also like during the conferences that I organized, we talk about NFT. What I did is I got my team in Thailand, go to the orphanage home that I help in Mesa and I got all the students draw the picture about their dreams. Um, and then I show it to um, the audience in my conference. We want to work with my, uh, another friends of mine, Finnish artists, to convert all these photo or pictures to the NFT and how to raise funds. That's what we plan. So we want to uh, do something that convince them, a uh, the role model for them, to do something together in the community to help people. I haven't told you why I went to Dubai. Um, we used Dubai, uh, organized everything in Dubai because of last year um, in February, I was selected as one of 12 fintech founders from London to do first trade mission trip with the UK government to the Mail of London program to UAE the first time they did. And they selected 12 companies. I'm one of them, only one female founders and only one Asian 
So we noticed you were a panelist for the Bloomberg Summit at APEC in Bangkok recently. Could you describe what this experience was like and what were some of the topics you had to discuss? Uh, it was fantastic. Um, I told everyone I'm, I like I'm nobody among somebody. <laughs> Because um, in Thailand, I don't think people know me much compared to uh, UK and Europe. Um, so I was honored to be among the Minister of Finance, the Chairwoman of K Bank, uh, chair, Chairman of Bangkok Bank, the President of, I think, Boeing. <laughs> so I feel like I'm, well, I'm nobody. I was nobody among somebody, but it was an honor to be there, uh, share my experience, challenges. The topic that I was on the panel is about women in tech. We were, as one of the founders of the women in tech and challenges that I have. And they asked me questions about challenges I have in fundraising and how did I survive and share the experience to, to the audience. So in your opinion, what are some issues that women founders and entrepreneurs face within the tech industry? If you read the many articles, they always saying that 3% of the money from VC uh, went to the woman, right? Imagine like, okay, it's very tough for women in, in especially in my space, uh, fintech, to raise funds. And also, you know, yeah, I'm not only like a woman, I'm Asian. And uh, my business is in, in Western countries as well. So even tougher for me as a, in UK, they call BAMES, like Black Asian ethnic Minorities, to raise the money. I think f f what, the most challenging for me is fundraising. Um, the rest, you know, like I, I'm sure that I can do, it doesn't matter if I'm men or women. You know, I could be in the meeting, I could set up a company, I can talk to people. So fundraising one of the challenges that I face as a woman. You mentioned that fundraising was a personal challenge that you've had to face. Was there anything else? And also, what would be your advice to women and how would you advise them to overcome various challenges? I believe that as a woman, if we can show that you can do what you plan and you have passion, like for me, I have passion to do what I want to, to sit on my fintech and also to encourage people to not just thinking about money or technology, but thinking about how to use technology and money to help people. And I always tell everyone, including my angel investors and my team, that I have a 12-year plan. And then after I exit my business, I have only 12 years and I have to make it happen. I want to be a full-time missionary. So I have my goal <laughs> set again clear that this is going to be my last uh, business ventures. After I exit, I want to become a full-time missionary. You know, even though I face many challenges, I have to make it happen. So our next question is about your personal journey. What path did you take to get to where you are right now? And have you always been interested in business and technology? Businesses, yes. Uh, I shared with the uh, students here earlier that when I was 15, I, um, I and my, a few friends in a high school, we arranged, um, what do you call, I don't know, a club. We sold the ticket to 50 baht many, many years ago. It made it when I was 15. And we uh, hired a venue in a hotel. Central Department Store. Um, what was the name of the hotel? Marriott, right? <laughs> At that time, a long time ago, they, they just uh, opened the hotel. So we arranged, we hired a room during the daytime on Saturday. We sold ticket 250. And we, um, in the beginning, we couldn't sell the ticket. So from seven students who wanted to do it together, and they drop off and then only three left, one girl and two boys. And then, um, we, we, still, um, we didn't give up. And at the end, um, we sold out and people in the queue and then we, we got profit when you made in 100,000 baht which is over 2,500 2, pounds when we were, was 15. So I always interested in business. When I went to study in UK, when I was a student in 1999, I was the first person who do the uh, website, you know, during that combo. I, I learned the, how to code and do PhD with my engineering friends. So we did, I did the first website for Thailand. So Tourism Authority of Thailand in UK um, ran my website and they pay me like 500 pounds every month and launch it. Launch a proper launch, official launch, to use as their official website for almost two years. I sold the website to them. And you know, I study finance, right? Finance and auditing, but I always have an eye on technology. And I learn it, you know, even though you study anything else, if you're interested in something, you can do it. I can do website myself. Even now, when we do the fintech, I still involved with all the IT team. So I learn about coding something as well. So I learned the basics. So I know when I talk to my tech team, so I know what we should think about. And I set up my IT, um, AI team, the two engineering from university. So um, I told them how to use AI to set up a small team, to use, how to use AI to track the unusual transactions, to do monitoring transactions. So you have basically I can learn with them as well. 
We'd like to end our interviews by asking our guests for some advice. So our final question is, what advice would you give to young people who are thinking about careers in the tech industry or about starting technology-focused companies of their own? If you're interested in something like me, I'm interested in blockchain. You have to be interested in and have passion about how to learn it. I, first, like I did, what I did is um, I studied it and involved in the group of people who are interested in the same thing. In 2016, after I read a book about blockchain, I didn't jump into doing business straight away. So I joined the blockchain, the first group in London, you know, to, to join them and have the research with them. And then I invest in other company who started the blockchain, um, cross-border payment first. So I invest with them and involve with them and work for free to, to learn with them for a year. And then after that, I set up my own business. And then I know that my passion is um, about how to use technology to help people. And then after I exit, this is what I want to do. So you have to have clear plan. FinTech technology is very, very tough business. And I, I because I, I think my background is ready to, to help my business. I have my PhD in compliance in the bank. And uh, my first job after university, I work for Cooper's and Library, which is the Price Waterhouse Cooper. So I qualify as a CPA. So my background helped me in compliance and I lecture as well. So I did some research and I have startup. Um, I did my dot-com business before. So I have experience before because of in, if you don't have lots of money in the beginning, you have to raise lots of funds. So you have to have experience that the investor would trust in you and you have to have good team as well. Okay, compassion, believe in what you're doing and make sure that you have basic knowledge about what you're doing. If you do fintech, either technology or compliance would help and fundraising. You have to have a proper team and uh, because when you raise funds, the investor will look at who's your team and what is the pain point you try to solve and your team and your compassion and your background experience. Thank you so much for coming on today. It has been an honor. Thank you so much for sharing your inspiring story. Thank you for having me. One, two, three, four. This past week, we witnessed our students present their amazing capstone projects. It was great to see the students' hard work and the uniqueness of all of their projects. For our listeners who don't know what capstone projects are, these are community service projects that serve as a final goal for the students to accomplish before graduating. The students aim to create sustainable projects that will help serve their communities. And these projects help students improve their project management skills and help them to get to know the communities around them. We are back with part two with Mr. Mike, the Learning Service Coordinator at ICS. Welcome to the podcast. Can you please introduce yourself, tell us what you do, and how long you've been at ICS? Thanks for having me here, guys. My name is Mike Holden. I am married. I've got two kids, and I've been at ICS since the 2014-15 school year, so this is year number nine for me. Uh, so part of my job is to like kind of help uh, ICS and our community to yeah be involved in helping and reaching out to other communities around us. So how did you get involved in the area of social work? Social work, I think, is an interesting term, an appropriate term, I guess, that I've never really thought of myself as a social worker in that sense. But I think the phrase makes sense. But I think a lot of this really just kind of came from, like, growing up and experiences that I had as I grew up. So I definitely saw my parents uh, serving in church and in school and in other places. Uh, so just kind of tagging along with them in different things. And then while I was in high school, uh, definitely be involved in student council. And that was really like the primary avenue, I think, for like our school to be involved in service and things like that. So there were always like little projects that we were doing, fundraisers or like little drives or things like that. I think another experiences that were, I think, helpful for me was I was able to go on two kind of service trips to Mexico in kind of middle school, high school age, eighth grade, ninth grade. So I think a lot of those experiences just kind of helped to like provide that like broad foundation of like, well, this is just what you do. Um, and then I think like when I moved to Dalat uh, in Malaysia, I was teaching there. Again, it was just kind of something that you did. So again, while I was involved with student council there, like, well, student council and we do service projects. And so like, what are we going to do? As a middle school coordinator there, then I also just kind of helped students, middle school students to be involved in different service projects and, or awareness campaigns or things like that. So we were kind of worked on things like that every quarter. So again, just kind of something that we always kind of did and just kind of built out of that. Uh, and then I was able to move to Indonesia. And I think kind of the idea with that 
that in part was to be more kind of on the front lines, like rather than uh, helping students to do service or the school to do service is really being in communities and, and helping uh, more directly. And so basically I helped to run kind of salt trips for other schools and to take those students into, yeah, a lot of different villages uh, around the resort that I got to work at. So what are some of your thoughts on the central role that community service plays in the ICS community? I think that this has been kind of a central idea for ICS from the beginning. So really, that's a pretty cool uh, legacy, really, of kind of 30 years of, I think, that being really a an important character trait or value of ICS. Uh, and I really think that's like kind of a reflection of the parents and their dedication to serving others, especially even in their own work outside, you know, and what they do as an adult and serving, especially like marginalized communities here in Thailand. What were some challenges you overcame during your service projects? Yeah, I think this is a good question. I think no matter what you do, there's always going to be challenges. So yeah, I think the key is like us learning through those. So I think some of the challenges I've had difference in expectations between like the people that we're serving or working with and then maybe what our expectations are. So sometimes that's things like time and like how long things should take or the organization of things. I think another challenge is related to like facilitating like larger groups. And so oftentimes uh, if we're working with a partner, they're not used to like organizing a service thing for a hundred students or something like that. And so the way service happens with a, a smaller group group versus a bigger group the way I might do something by myself is different and so I think that sometimes has been a little bit of a challenge in sort of working those things out I think another example is when we do things and we think we're helping and maybe it's even sometimes what they've asked for but then in reality it's not actually helping the way we think it's going to it almost can even hurt so quick example of that is one of the first projects we worked on in Indonesia we went to the school working with the school and we're like noticing hey like there's no fans in these classrooms. It's super hot. This is a, a super rural school. Do you think that fans would be a good idea to help cool down your classroom a little bit? That's got to be much better for students. Like, yeah, like fans would be great. We'd love to have fans. So we bring in a group, they bring some fans, they get them installed. It's awesome. Next time we go to the village, like, hey, wow, we got the fans up. That's awesome. Can we turn them on? Because it's kind of hot in here. And they're like, oh yeah, um, we actually don't have electricity until seven at night. So we've got fans for the students, but there's never fans on when the students are here. So they were like, yeah, but it's great. Like we actually use the rooms for then community meetings and like evening stuff with the parents and stuff like that. So it's great. They were very appreciative of the fans, but our intent of like helping out students totally missed the mark. And so I think that's another challenge, right? Is like actually understanding what's happening to then be able to address that directly and what something that's actually fits and is actually a need and feasible with the community. Thank you for sharing. So since this episode is about legacy, how would you define legacy and how would an individual create a positive and lasting legacy through service-oriented work or activities? Yeah, legacy. This is a, a good question. The first thing that people think about when they think about legacy is how people are going to remember me, right? Like, so how will people remember the class of 2023, right? And sometimes that's definitely part of it. Uh, I think also it can be changes that are made or like even like things that are a part of the place or the school. And so it's kind of like the stuff that lasts. I think sometimes it can be really good. It can be a really positive element. Element, and then sometimes it's a little less beneficial. So again, we could be bringing like this great gift to ICS. I can think of some really great things that were donated even to like ICS. And some of those things are used really well and are really appreciated. And maybe even have been used so much that they've been replaced by the school then, which is awesome. But there's other things that have been donated or given that are like, hey, this is great. W where do we store this now, right? Like how long do we have to keep this before we can get rid of it, right? So that would be maybe like an example of like a negative legacy, right? I think the idea is, yeah, how do we understand what are going to be the most beneficial impacts or things that we can leave behind when we leave. So how do you say we're working on this at ICS and what impact do you think our students can have on society? 
So legacy as a school, I think one of the ways that we are working on that is just to continually improve our partnerships with like other communities. Uh, and one of those ways is more and more asking ourselves, like how can we impact or benefit like our neighbors? Are we a good neighbor to the people right around us? Uh, we go on salt trips that are hours away, right? But are we doing anything for the people that are within walking distance of us? Like how are we helping them? And so I think that's like an area that we're going to continue to explore and grow. Yeah, and hopefully as a school, we're able to be good neighbors. I think another area is like with our students. Hopefully you are that legacy as well, that as you move out from ICS, there are certain traits, certain values that you have, and that that will continue with no matter where you live around the world. Uh, so some of those things I think that are really important is like seeking first to understand others before we like make assumptions. And then as we understand like our posture and how you respond to other people, uh, so not just like a solution that works well for me, but through my understanding, am I able to help you in a way that then is beneficial for you? We like to ask our guests to share advice before ending each episode. So what advice would you give not only to students, but adults as well regarding how they can get involved with service or service oriented activities? Yeah, sometimes I feel like there are just like barriers that are like, oh, I'm not sure how this is going to work or I'm a, uh, I, I don't feel super comfortable. Jump in. That's number one advice. Jump in. Just do it. I think you'll find that most of the time, wow, this experience is like way cooler than I anticipated. And with that, like be relational. So get to know people that you are serving or that you are working with. And I think those connections are huge. So be relational, get to know people. Uh, and then lastly, like be flexible. <laughs> you walk in, we all walk in with a lot of expectations, a lot of assumptions about how things we think are gonna be, but we gotta like release those as much as possible and be flexible and willing to, yeah, adapt and just serve. Thank you so much, Mr. Mike. It was great to have you on the podcast with us. And with that advice about service, something we are all capable of getting involved with. We are running out of time. Thank you again for joining us. As we end this episode, we'd like to thank our guests and listeners for helping us make this podcast possible. Our next episode will be about forensic science, criminology, and followed up by some dumb bad guy stories. As always, this podcast would not be possible without the hard work and support of our international student production team. All music and sound effects are courtesy of Pixabay.com, a vibrant community of creatives sharing copyright-free images, videos, and music. And we are signing off until next time. We are Students Incorporated, because your voice matters.